Hey everybody, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We've reached episode 643. It's September 1st, 2021. Yes, it's already September, which is ludicrous. It's unacceptable on Smash and Peak. I'm Brett Van Sprunberg. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Kent Burgess. You can subscribe to find out when we go live for events such as this podcast recording session by going to pcper.com slash subscribe. You can support us on Patreon. Become a patron of PC Per and support this. The long pauses. You know, the lack I, of I, rehearsals. I, You'd think that we'd have this down by now. No. 600. No. We're just trying to make it dramatic. Look, we could we could barrel through this this episode in 10 minutes, but we want to we want to entertain you. We well, you, take you on did you journey. go to the, the Bill Shatner school of speaking on a podcast? What? You have to go Are very you? slow and then very fast. It's, it's like you're winding up for the, for the punch. <laughs> like, I don't know if you know it, but it's time for Burger of the Week. Josh. Burger of the Week. This is uh, called The Teacher's Pet. And uh, it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, not uh, You wouldn't think that some of these flavors would go together, but it actually worked out really well. First, it's the, the famous double patties on the sesame seed bun. And layered in there is cream cheese, fresh sliced apples, and then topped with bacon and caramelized onions. A really interesting mix of... of Beef, sweet, and sour, all mixed together with that tartness of of the apple, and it just it just was a fantastic experience. I you should come to town and have one because you'll be full for another twenty four hours, and you'll be happy about it. Happy, and plus you get vitamin C, so scurvy is it's not a thing if you eat this burger. Bur- bur- burger. It was a good burger, and I'm happy I had it. Good. And are you going to yeah. fast for the next 24 hours? Is Yep. Is that real? Okay. It's just just between you and me, Josh. It's not like a recording or okay. live on the internet or anything. Is that bullshit? Do you really fast for 24 hours? I mean, come on. Yes. You're going to break- have breakfast tomorrow. No. No, I, I will have lunch tomorrow. tomorrow. That would be my first um, oh, meal okay. after. Okay. Was you, did you have dinner? I mean, literally, I'm just, I feel so full still. <laughs> Uh, Windows 11. It's launching next month. We have one month. Prepare yourselves. They obviously didn't because it's this half-baked mess that nobody understands. Ready or not, mostly not, Microsoft will launch Windows 11 next month. The company named the date yesterday in a blog post with the free upgrade and new PC preloads coming October 5. October 5. They're thrilled to announce. So you'll, you'll go into your local you know computer shop Best Buy, whatever, and there'll be computers offered with Windows 11 pre-installed on their integrated graphics because you still can't buy a GPU. Are you excited? So excited. Ah, Apprehensive. I just have this feeling that we're looking at Vista, the rebirth. (laughs) Well, you know what? It's it's kind of every other one, isn't it? I mean, the track record is every other one is good. The other, you know, an opposite one is every other one is not quite as good. I think this is on yeah, the not quite as good beat. And 90, 98 was okay. And then yeah. 98 SE was great. ME mm-hmm. sucked. Mm-hmm. And then 2000 was good. And XP was good. Mm-hmm. Oh, Vista okay. There's two in a row, I guess. 7 was good. 8 yeah. was weird. 8.1 was yeah. better. 10. 10 better. No. 10. Yeah, yeah, but, okay. yeah but the rollout. The rollout of 10 was... Oh, come- well, yes, but not eventually smooth. ten became. Okay. You're right, and they had a ten, very big. The look, tiles, here, not a good problem. The ten. Or, sorry, I mean I'm just talking over you. Sorry, but ten no. ten was Microsoft's new Coke moment. They released eight. It was terrible. They got rid of what was his name? Sanofsky, who was the guy behind the tile interface. I don't remember. I don't yeah, but they they kept that for a bit, and then right. Well, they were still pursuing phone at Metro. the time. Yeah, the Metro, right. which you don't yeah, call Metro. it Metro. It's the tile interface, right? Because they had to drop yeah, Metro right. and they got rid of the guy. Right. And anyway, the then they came out with 8.1 and it brought back the start 
button, but it didn't really have a start menu. You could right click and get all your like power user options. You could shut down from there. But 10, they actually brought back the start menu. So it was like, hey, eight sucks. 10 comes out and it's got a start menu. So don't look, look over here. It's a start menu. Don't look at all of the tracking and BS that we're doing. Don't look at the fact this is the most invasive operating system that's ever been released. By the way, I, I the, one of the most most vaunted features of Windows 11, the compatibility with Android, actually not going to be there at first, from my understanding. Not shipping, so gonna have to wait. Yeah, yeah, gonna have to wait a while for that one. I enjoyed reading Gordon's uh, scathing post at PC World about the Windows 11 fiasco. So, mm. and I linked that in my little news post. So just read Gordon. Cloudflare, who wants to read this news story from the register? Jeremy's not here. Well, I mean, I can take a stab at it here. But the interesting thing is, is that I thought Josh might might want to chime in on this, is that they took a look at Intel's brand new spanking new Xeon Ice Lake processors, put together a whole bunch of test systems and decided that, and this is when you have to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, with these guys. They ran too hot and too um, power hungry to to warrant the um, the performance envelope. So they actually went with obviously AMD Epix CPUs and uh, are saving tons of money and uh, tons of cooling. And it's a little bit surprising that uh, yeah, several hundred can't compete watts here. per yeah, I know. server. It's embarrassingly That's, high. We're talking data center. Yeah, that's a lot. Josh, did you? I don't know if you read this particular article, but did you I notice did they also backed down their RAM? They were trying to equip each server with with uh, five twelfth uh, gig, and they determined that uh, it, the performance didn't warrant um, putting that much RAM in, so they backed it down to three eighty four or three um, three hundred eighty four gig. But they did find performance was worth it, bumping the speed up, especially on Epic, from twenty nine thirty three to thirty two hundred, and that was worth uh, fixing. So sort of interesting when it's when the dollars really count. I'll just say it, Intel, it was not worth it. And AMD was an easy buy in their case for Cloudflare. Interesting data point. That's crazy talk. It's like it is, 2004 it all over again. Yeah, they're yeah. doing that well. And, and this is server space. Remember that this is server space. So, you know, we often think about the fact that, oh, what? I don't care. You know what? So what? It draws 100 more watts from the wall, you know? Just overclock it. And when it really matters, you you don't buy Intel for <laughs> see, Yeah, when power when you're when you're dealing with five thousand racks, you know, well, five thousand, yeah. you know two you servers in a mm-hmm. cool low data location, that couple hundred extra watts makes a massive difference. You're talking twenty kilowatt difference. Yeah, they also dropped the number of hard drives, uh, also. Um, they had three in each unit. Now they're down to two. So they're looking for savings all over the place. And it's interesting to follow uh, the tactics of companies that um, really actually have to pay for this stuff and what it is that they're spending their money on and how they're deploying their infrastructure. And, you know, what really matters. Is there, it all matters. Is there any validity to this, like real world validity to these supposed Ryzen processor vulnerability story this apparently affects all amd processors not just zen 2 and zen plus as apparently was yeah that wasn't reported. yeah that wasn't known at first it was something along the lines of uh it was only affecting the older ones but apparently it actually affects the all of them um it's 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 akin to the original speculative execution bug that was discovered in intel although the mitigation for this is not going to be for any performance impact AMD also has rated it as a medium level, and it looks like it's going to be either mitigatable through firmware, or they're actually suggesting that the app vendors do what are, what's called an L fence around the calls that matter, where they're dealing with um, data that needs to be protected. So I don't know how I feel about that, about the the CPU vendor calling out to their their sensitive app, you know, man- makers and saying, "Oh yeah, make sure this extra instruction goes in." You know, around your your data that needs to be protected, I, I think they're probably going to be able to patch this, but it doesn't appear that it's really going to be performance impact like it was with Intel. So, looks like they're going to. Uh, there's a lot of noise being made about this, and I really think it's a little bit overblown as to the extent 
of what this situation is, and I think they're going to be able to mitigate it. That's my read right now. Hmm. Any more comments about this? So it's not a it's I'm, not it's not a spectrum meltdown, but it's something you it, you have yeah, to. It is deal a little with. yeah. Kitty, it is a little speculative kitty. execution type thing, and the ability to kind of uh, do a write back into a special address space where they could sort of trick the CPU for to flush data that if you, you can sort of trick it into flushing data and then accessing it later because you know where it went. That's kind of how it, how it works. Should we talk about the <laughs> malware in your GPU's VRAM story or is that too... Like, we're not a security I, podcast. Have you done... No, I know, but this? there's a lot of this... A lot of the stuff that's going on right now, people are getting scared about this sort of thing. And it's not, it sort of seemed like it was a big deal, but it, the fact is it's been here before. But this, there's a several news podcasts out there today talking about this cyber hack, malicious code, and stuff hiding in your VRAM and things of that. And it's, it's the, the most interesting thing I found about this particular article is when they said, oh yeah, the, the UHD graphics are just as susceptible to it. So it doesn't even have to be a discrete GPU. Which I found sort of interesting, but this this so I this when, situation. Oh, go ahead. When antivirus is is going to have the ability to uh, access GPU memory to be able to scan for this, and what kind of performance do we see, and and who's actually in control? Because um, you know GPUs have become more and more CPU like in in how they they handle things, um, even though it's you know it's not quite, but I mean it's it's it, but it kind of is. So you've got, you know, dispatch and JLUG. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they, uh, they work to do this because, you know, even in integrated graphics, it kind of, you know, does a logical partition off of, of your memory. So it's got a block that is just dedicated to it. And I know, you know, in the past AMD and NVIDIA has worked on, you know, a flat memory, you know, space, um, so everything is is better, um, you know. You're you're more able to access stuff. So it, it's going to be curious to see how the AV guys uh, address this because it's it's important. There's actually been been rootkits for Linux that have been tucked into um, GPU VRAM in the past, and that's what kind of the the next couple of links that I I had actually put in the show notes, which indicated that this is not the first time this has happened. This is actually old news. Um, if you want to bring up one of those other ones, just look at the dates on these old, older articles when you pull those up. I'll just hang If out I pull those up. Nah, you don't have to. But it sort of illustrates the point that people get panicked about a lot of things that are not new and have been around a long time. Oh, wow. This and article is from 2013. I mean, we've got great tools with OpenCL and CUDA you could potentially develop all this stuff on to run on GPUs. So yeah, it's not new, but it's, it's something that they have not, I don't think it was low hanging fruit for them. And now it's tough. Now it's now, it now, it now it's within reach. So yeah, we're going to start seeing those things and the security world's going to have to adjust and uh, start, uh, you know, being more serious about this. There was a German researcher in that article in 2013 that was working on an antivirus uh, ability to check out GPU RAM. And the previous article was actually indicating uh, situations where um, hackers or, or people who were trying to figure this out, whether it was possible or not, were tucking malicious code into GPU space way back in 2010. So that was what the other article was about, just to illustrate that this has been around a long time. It's nothing new. And there was at least somebody looking into trying to enhance virus scanning into GPU dedicated space. I don't know if they thought about like UHD space, like you were talking about, Josh, but uh, at least it's been thought about in the research space, but nothing commercial is doing it. Yeah. I got a point there. Hmm. As far yes. as I know, as far as I know, point. nothing commercial is doing it. Burf. I'm just thinking, will antivirus start lowering the performance of our GPUs now if it needs to run on VRAM? Oh, that would be that would be sweet. <laughs> New Norton antivirus for your GPU, which it only needs like forty percent of your memory. It's fine. Hey, you want to know something funny? I actually saw a sixty six hundred XT for a little above MSRP on Best Buy available the, today, and I I was considering it, but I've already spent too much money in the past month. 
but it was there and it was just out there and it lasted about 10 minutes and then it was gone. <laughs> but I've never seen it last that long. Crazy. Do you think, unrelated to anything, Josh, we've talked about this a lot in the last year. Do you think mm -hmm. that, are you going to stay with your prediction that hardware availability would return by the end of this year? Because it seems like the price normalization for GPUs has started to erode, and now we're starting to see it spike again. Um, part of that may just be back to school and that kind of demand. And uh, Q3, Q4 is always your top two quarters of the year. And we've seen nothing <laughs> in the past two years that would uh, say that that wouldn't be the case. So... Yeah, I think it's still, I mean, we're still in pandemic mode and uh, with, you know, the COVID going back up again, people are clamping down and uh, same with, you know, production uh, and supply chain. And, uh, but I think that it's going to, it's going to start improving here in October and, but it, it's not going to get, I mean, from everything that, that Lisa and Jensen have said, Who's whispering? No one. Anyway. No one's whispering, Josh. Uh, no one. Yeah, there's something in the background that's really strange. I'm not doing um, it. This is not, this is not, this is not that kind of podcast. <laughs> right. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think it, it's not probably going to be until end of spring next year that uh, we'll see shelves full of products and, and maybe an actual sale or two on graphics cards. A sale? Wow, that's really yeah, going on a limb, Josh. A sale? Yeah. Well, I mean, remember a couple of years ago when when the Vega fifty six went on sale for two seventy nine to I compete with uh, whatever Nvidia had at the yeah. time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a while. I think I I bought a uh, single fan tunnel cooled MSI. Yeah. You know, I've got the same one sitting downstairs. <laughs> it was like on sale for two hundred fifty nine dollars. I that's I think I paid like about that. Up. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Vega fifty six. It lives on. How much is that worth now? Like eight hundred bucks? No, six hundred. I, I actually Oh, okay. I, I, I sold it for about four fifty, actually. Nice. Okay. Uh this is a topic that there's a number of names out there. This this particular article that Jeremy wrote up for us a couple days ago is about Western Digital. With the SN550 cache fiasco. I think it's cache if you, if you read it well, in Jeremy's right. voice. Well, right, if I'm reading Jeremy's voice, yeah. yes. If we could think way back to the time when Crucial actually, you know, sort of pulled the same crap, replacing well-reviewed uh, TLC NAND um, P2, you know, NVMe disks with QLC NAND, and not very good ones, he points out. Uh, well past the review period, yeah, that sort of got them some bad brownie points, as you could say. Yeah, they and A data. A data was kind of made famous by that one. Right. And seeing how this is Western Digital, of the recent claim to fame with their NAS hard drive problem in their red series, switching from, uh, what was it, CMR to, or, um, uh, CM, uh, CMR to, or S to SMR, shingled recording from different platter recordings, where they substituted them without changing the part numbers and dramatically affected, horrendously affected raid times. Yeah. So this is the same Western Digital who's putting out this. You'd think, you know, maybe they would learn something. Everybody's doing it. Look, it's the trend. Oh. Samsung oh. caught swapping okay. components. They are replacing not the NAND, though, which was interesting. They're still using TLC NAND in the 970 Evo Plus drive. All but right, they, what do they have do here? changed out the controller... And it's a controller that offers significantly lower performance. So it's you're not even getting close to the performance uh, that you'll see in any reviews because it's a different <clears> part <throat> number. Mm -hmm. And you don't know this until you actually get the drive out of the box because you can't see the actual part number on the controller until you have the drive in your hand. So it goes from this thing that ends with uh, HBLU and the old version ended in HBLR. I don't know if it's just a lower number of channels. Uh, I'm not sure. Exactly well, what the at least the is. 
at least they changed the part number though, right? Back to the yeah, WDS but not anywhere N550. you can see it. No, no, you All can't right, see granted, the change on granted. the outside of the package. All I don't know right. if this is I don't You're know if right. this is a global thing or not because the original report and video I believe was in Mandarin, so this is for like Mandarin. Oh, China. hang on, let's take a look at the speeds here. What did they do here? Uh, 32, 32, 20, oh, 24, 31, 29, 26, Wait a 22, minute. 28. I'm not I'm not seeing a pattern. The, the here. old 19, is on the left and the new is on the yeah. right. So the new controller okay. is in, faster? No. In some cases the new controller was faster on Why? Rights, uh, I think that this is just depths. labeled wrong. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, Why is there get, an get entire get the, news like, story about the fact that the performance is better now? Ah, I think gosh, left I know. and right got swapped here. You oh, know, right. you just want people to prove you it, just want people to click be finger apparently. pointing. If they're going to be finger pointing, the least they could do is prove it. But the SN550, legitimately, I mean, they changed their the uh, SLC cache to, to all QLC stuff, and the performance dropped forty percent when it outran the SLC initial cache, and when it outran that, it was like a forty plus percent drop in speed. No part number change. This seems wrong. This doesn't doesn't yeah. seem doesn't seem all that cricket, as they say. Well, like the thing it. is, this has been this has been going on not just in the computer industry, but in in most industries for a long time. How many times have you seen the clause specification subject subject to change without notice um, on anything? Uh, and I'm not defending this, mind you. I'm just saying it's been going on a lot longer than you know just the last few hard drives changing a controller or whatever. Um, I remember a. Uh, uh, a PC pers- uh, podcast several years ago um, before I was part of the team where they were talking, uh, you were talking about a power supply review from about a year before. And you were saying, you know, then it was made by uh Seasonic. It, it was the OE on it, but now you have no idea if that's still the case or not. And there's really no way to find out unless you get a new unit and, tear it down and re-review it. Um, and so the question is, is is, is the uh, specification subject to change clause enforceable or does there need to be a movement made to make manufacturers be more open when they do this sort of thing? In addition to you know, these other problems, have they had an issue with their 750 series drives on, on – uh, chip side amd motherboards i think that was that a rumor that i heard recently about I've like their performance was having an issue on that non-cpu I've... lane right it's supposed to be a bug if it's connected to the piece like the chipset lanes yeah the i think it's the right performance is drastically cut yeah and it's not a physical limitation of the drive it's just a bug apparently which was fixed with the 850s i don't have a controller bug to verify this i could dig out a 750 but yeah, but yeah, yeah that's... Kona Five Twelve did that uh, link with the uh, SN Eight Fifty. Yeah, SN Eight Fifty got the fix, but the Seven Fifty did not. Okay, that's why you, you gotta hook it up to those CPU lanes anyway. I mean, that's I'm always trying to do that True. to get the best performance out of the yeah. SSD. But then obviously you, you only have so my many, game drive got two slots. My game drive's on the chipset one, mm. but my boot. Yeah. Yeah, you might not notice it with your game drive, really. No. Well, but it's not but it's it's a uh it's a mushkin. It doesn't have that problem. Mm-hmm. Apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true, true. But even then you're still doing a lot of multiplexing on the chipset. So I mean you're getting a lot of bus contention, you're getting a lot of other traffic on there, you know, talking to USB ports From and stuff what? like that. So uh, I don't know, whatever it is you have plugged down there. <laughs> you have you have <laughs> other other drives. It's that sound there? card, it's that sound card of his. PCI Damn, it is sound card. It is robbing speed PCI from that 4.0 intro. sound card. Oh, yep. no, it's not PCI cycle steel. Is it a by four? Is it a by one? <laughs> it is a by four. Oh, I think see? it's 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 not it's not pushing it because if you think about it, I mean the uh, the 570 chipset is is connected by PCI 4.0 to the CPU. So I'm using 3.0 uh, components. So we're not really getting any real contention. Hey, speaking Much. of things that are contentious, 
Mm. Remember, remember that RX mm. RTX 3090 game Amazon New World thing EVGA Oh my gosh it was like all the rage for like well, 10 days. And then Maybe EVGA so. was like hey we're going to replace these cards and the story kind of calmed down. <laughs> but EVGA uh, as reported by videocards.com with a z in case you don't know said it wasn't a fan controller that caused the cards to suddenly die. They have thoroughly tested two dozens, it says here, of RTX 3090 cards that. that were returned and found... So wait a minute, two dozens? So was it dozens? Well, Multiple dozens. There are dozens of us. Well, dozens. So it's, up as many as tough to say. 24 people had this problem and sent the card into EVGA. Look, this was an English to English translation. I mean, what are you going to do here? Yeah, I mean, PC on, World. I could just check the PC World article, I guess. But anyway, I'm right here. <laughs> so yeah, they said it was a problem with bad soldering. It was just faulty soldering. Yeah, which they've never seen that through, before. Through X rays, they actually had to determine this through X ray analysis, is what they say. And it was only supposed to affect several early cards built in 2020. So. I don't know. My opinion is your mileage may vary, but EBGA, stand-up company for coming out with uh, the root cause analysis on this. So good for them. And mm. sending out um, replacements. And interestingly enough, uh, the the early 39, as far as I know, all the 3090s still um, are made in either uh, from EVJ or made in either Taiwan or in China. Um Unlike and every wonder- other video card in the world? <laughs> well, well, no, no, no. I'm just saying, so if they've got a soldering issue, I wonder if it appears on models from both places or if it's just from either the Taiwan or the uh, Chinese factory. I, I'd have to agree. I think it would be systemic with wherever they were getting them manufactured, and it wouldn't have likely wouldn't have been relegated to just the 3090. So. Maybe the other cards just don't expose the problem or aren't pushed to such a degree. It was against the MOSFETs, so it's the power power delivery. So perhaps the connections on the other cards that were made were, I'm just conjecturing here, so I don't really know, were making it just fine, and they never got to the point where they had to deliver that many amps across a solder connection that was not quite as good as it needed to be. So you don't know, but I tend to agree. Yeah, materials is hard, and plus, you know... Um, getting the soldering material to be more environmentally safe has repercussions in uh, ductibility and other type uh, physical characteristics. Yeah, heat, heat cycling, uh, current carrying capacity, all yeah. those things, stiction, uh, temperature, like the, I don't know what you want to call it, like when it, when it cools and shrinks a little bit. There's lots of interesting physical characteristics going on there and it's it's sort of um, sad in in a way that our the what we've had to do to become ecologically more sound has made some of these things not quite as good. They they don't work as well. So as what you're saying is they bring like lead leaded. back to solder. Bring make, lead back to make solder. Make solder leaded again. Great again. And gasoline yeah. and yeah. Besides that, you have to get yes. you have to get leaded solder really really hot to actually start releasing. You know the what? Lead, but right? boy, that that was when soldering was good. Yeah, but the problem is, is they throw these things in dumps, and yeah, it all yeah. leaches out in the end. And you know, wait a minute, we yeah. throw away this stuff? What? No, electronic no. waste? No, really? Brett, don't worry. It's a beautiful, clean, pristine world, and there aren't horrible. Okay. There aren't there aren't uh, large barges of discarded electronics headed to some yeah, far eastern middle. country yeah. to be burned in an but, open pit. By, by children, yes. Yes. With no protective equipment of any kind. So. Sorry. <laughs> the Shadow Rock Slim. Uh, and I believe I mentioned in the first paragraph of this review how ridiculous Be Quiet's naming scheme is for these coolers. Um, but besides that, this is a really straightforward cooler. It's a single tower. Um 163 millimeters high, um, four uh, heat pipe with direct contact. Um, 
and a 135 millimeter fan that is amazing. This is absolutely, without a doubt, the quietest CPU cooler I have ever encountered in 12 years of custom PC building. Interesting. Kent, I don't know if you read it, but the fan says it's specifically silence optimized. Well, right. that's the thing. It doesn't know. usually they'll have like a, a brand for the fan. And this one just says fan one silence optimized be quiet fan. Doesn't but it, say I mean, like it silent wings. It doesn't, be quiet. it doesn't say Oh, you're right. Yeah. Okay. There's no branding. It's just it's just a silence optimized fan that is this specific to this cooler or is it just is it one of their like oh. Well, I will I will say this. This fan, um, upon physical inspection, looks exactly like the middle fan on the uh, T the the Dark Rock TF2, which is the other cooler, um, with one exception, uh, because that fan is only twenty two millimeters thick. This one would be twenty two millimeters, but there is a rubber sort of a rubberized ring that goes all the way around the side that contacts the the fins, ah. um, which makes it slightly thicker. Other than that, the two fans appear identical, have the same uh, RPM specs and everything. Um, but Could this band not only, be contributing to its exceptional silence, I wonder? Just absolutely. Just minute the, vibrations and... Yeah, the the fan it only spins at fourteen hundred RPMs first okay. off, yeah. but it's also one hundred and thirty five millimeters, which means that it's going to flow a bit more air than a hundred and twenty millimeter fan that's spinning fourteen hundred millimeters or fourteen hundred RPMs. Uh, the base on this is uh, flat, not quite as smoothly machined as that on the. Uh, I don't even remember what the name of that last one I did, the very short 92 millimeter fan model. Uh, but that was that Be pure, Quiet one you were really impressed was with. It, it was a, yeah, it was a small Be Quiet model. Um, pure Rock uh, Slim uh, yes. 2, <laughs> I think. Pure Rock There's Slim 2. And this is Shadow Electric Rock Boogaloo. Slim two. Yes. Okay. Exactly. All right, just you know, exactly. I, I saw that show. It was freaking awesome. But uh, you know, the intermission. You, you went straight home long. and got the cardboard out and went to your garage, didn't you? I did. You know what I did. Mm. Yeah. But the performance. The, I mean, this is a a very slim uh, cooler. Oh, yeah. Look how I slim mean, this is. Top view. It, and despite the this, despite the height of it. Um, mm. I was a little concerned that it was not going to do a great job cooling, but it did. Um, it did an amazing job cooling considering its size. It was only a, a degree at maximum warmer than uh, the Shadow Rock 3, which is a much larger cooler, albeit with a 120 millimeter fan. Um, Kent, it didn't even overhang and, the brackets on that picture that I just saw. It wasn't even wired no, it the doesn't. brackets holding it down no, to the CPU. It, it's not. Uh, you can install this uh, cooler extremely easily uh, just because you leave the fan off and you can get to both of the mounting screws uh, with no problem. Attach it down, click the fan onto it with the fan clips, plug it in, and you're set to go. So what's the catch? Uh, it performs well for its size. It's, it's quiet. It's, this it, the, the drawback is that if you really want your f computer to sound like a, a, a wind tunnel, uh, this is not the CPU cooler for you. <laughs> oh, I see. So that's the that's the catch. <laughs> oh, damn. Oh, good performance. But damn you it, know what? it's I too quiet. I miss those Delta Black <laughs> days. Let me yeah. tell you. When you're, when really you're entire blasting sound shakes. From the yeah. Delta and Black. <laughs> really? <laughs> at, I love those Deltas, man. Max, love them. <laughs> at max RPM, you can hear this fan. I could hear it on an open test bench, but one of the things, and I believe I mentioned it in the article, that was kind of impressive was even though it's audible, it had sort of a pleasant tone. There was no harshness to the tone. It would just sounded like 
you know, wind or something very, very subtle. Um, the, and then, the, and that's at 1400 RPM. Nine, passing gas. <laughs> You know yes. what? I didn't even hear that. <laughs> anyway, but so <laughs> I'm, I've lost it now. So, but down a personal problem. from like a 1100 RPMs and lower, even on an open test bench, I pretty much had to put my ear very probably dangerously close to this fan to hear it. What happened to your luxuriantly long hair when it got close to that fan? Oh, oh I pulled it back. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm, all right. I was going to say, Just I, I think I figured it out, Kent. I figured out why it's so quiet. In this <laughs> picture here, you can tell the fan, it's not actually spinning. It's not spinning. You shouldn't no. take noise measurements of a fan that's not even plugged into anything. <laughs> it's, it's very quiet. It's like that, it measures the, it has a noise volume, damn near it has a noise volume of a block of aluminum. <laughs> You were just, it was just the volume of your own heavy breathing as you stood over the fan, holding your hair back. <laughs> Very possibly. I'm mute Very now. possibly. <laughs> so uh, how much is this thing again? $45.90? $45.90. And, That's cheap. you know, as long as you're, as long as you're not planning on overclocking, um, which the way the, the Ryzen 5000 series works and response to overclocking, you're really just better off using the uh, performance boost enhancements and letting temperature and and the 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 BIOS manage the speeds. This cooler is really because AMD has only spent millions of dollars on that technology. Only spent millions, yeah, probably billions, but yeah, maybe. But yeah. It, it just it performed fantastically. No, no pun intended. It was great. Um, if you're not doing anything crazy, if you're not going to be, you know, encoding video for hours and hours on end, then this is all you need. No, it's 160 watt, by the way. I was just oh, wow. checking. Okay. You can't really compare the the wattage output as far as heat goes between AMD and Intel. And I almost wonder if it's the same, if they use the same math that they use to determine uh, architecture size, because you can't really measure the way transistors are designed now. So uh, it oh, almost sounds like, like you're seven doing seven nanometer, seven well, nanometer yeah, and 10 Intel nanometer. seven X-ray microscope. That's, mm-hmm. Anyway, lithography doesn't. Did you mean lie. Intel Four? Is that what you meant? Intel no, because Intel. Well, because Intel. Never mind. <laughs> I I think this this almost sounds like the tube versus solid state argument. Like you can't really compare watts to watts because there's tube watts and then there's solid state mm. watts. Like, okay, You're right. About that's that, also though. true, but then again, tube amps are often paired with very high sensitivity speakers. So you've peaked at my pick of the week, have you? No, I have not. Okay. Uh, speaking of. <laughs> massive power stations of CPUs. Well, you need something more than just a $45 inexpensive 160 watt cooler. What about dual fan? Look at this. Is that what you're holding? Are you holding the dark Wait, there we rock? Go. Now this is... Let's check the girth of that. Sandwich. Oh, it's, oh. it's a dual tower cooler, but it's folded over. We've seen a design like this from Noctua. They have a, a down-firing mm -hmm. uh, cooler like this. This one looks a little bit beefier, though. This is... It's definitely beefy. Um, but even as large as it looks, it's pretty compact and most... Look at this. In most ways, when you mount it on the motherboard, it's nowhere near as tall. Yeah, it it's nowhere near as tall as your traditional dual tower, you know, your NHD 15s, your Dark Rock Pro 4. Um, all of those exceed 160 millimeters in height. Um, this is 134. And 230 watts of heat dissipation at 134. Yes, 
Um, well, so you're cool in the non-overclocked that... 11 series. Sorry, Josh, Josh go ahead. Gosh. You got direct cooling on the actual block itself, that the chunk of copper where all the heat pipes go through. And so that's that's got to count for something. And it blows straight down on your RAM, straight down on your VRMs. It's a really great idea and a great concept. And they pulled it off admirably because um, I was hesitant to think that this cooler could come close to matching a Dark Rock Pro 4. And it pretty much did. Uh, TDP on those is 250 watts. This is 230. This came within spitting distance of a Dark Rock Pro 4. Or Pro 3 is the model that I had to test, but essentially they're the same. Um, and the most beautiful thing of this is the first time ever Be Quiet has a mounting system that doesn't make me want to gouge my eyes out. <laughs> what is different it's, about it? It looks kind of the, the same hardware. It's essentially the same, but the biggest thing is that the cross brace at the cold plate uh, is permanently attached. Okay. And the screws, the screws oh. are captive. Okay, nice. So, yes. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So once you put the 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 spacers and those brackets on to the motherboard in, you just put this cooler on there and take a screwdriver and screw it on. You're done. You, well, you slide the fans. Oh, well, yeah, you got to slide that, that metal fan in there. Yeah. But it it took 15 minutes total to to mount this cooler. Um, and well, you know, everybody, everybody mounts job. their coolers at different speeds, Ken. So, you know, you don't have to <laughs> brag about your cooler mounting stamina. Hey, I just want to, I just noticed that you've got some Trident Z uh, RAM on there, which is not an insignificantly, uh, you know, no, it's yeah, not it goes short right RAM. Over the Trident Z. And I was, I was sort of concerned, and that was one of the reasons I used that RAM. I was a little concerned that the middle fan would n not go in without removing the ram sticks, but it fit fine. Um, and actually, uh, in that photo, I was actually putting the wrong fan in. The top fan is 25 yeah. millimeters and the middle is 22. So there's actually three millimeters more clearance than you see in that photo. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. What about performance? Uh, uh, great. Which we obviously saw in the previous graphs, but pretend we didn't. And for the first time <laughs> ever, you're seeing the TF2. Here it is, third from the top. That's pretty damn good. Right up so there this, under a Dark Rock Pro 3. Right. Uh, just behind it, um, within two and a half degrees of a of an AI, a 240 millimeter AIO, uh, three degrees cooler than a Shadow Rock 3. Um, and you, like I say, this is 134 millimeters. This could fit in a lot of your smaller cases quite easily. Uh, and out of my own curiosity, I took the top fan off and tried it with just the middle fan. So then it becomes a 109 millimeter tall cooler. So this could fit in a lot of smaller form factor builds. And the performance is still excellent. What about noise? It's uh, with the single fan. It's almost as quiet as the Shadow Rock Slim we just talked about. Mm. But considering, as we discussed, that is that fan is essentially the same. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. And you know, even with both fans, it's a little under forty-one decibels. That's at full speed. Yes. And that's also, you know, blowing some warm air down on your VRMs. It's kind of cooling your memory a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's what they used to call uh, a fan, you know, back in the day when all CPU fans just blew down towards some other port. Right. But it's kind of a novelty now, but it's, I like it. And it's the only way certain cases are going to allow an air cooler with this kind of cooling capacity is if you go with this sort of sandwich design like this. My Although biggest concern be with this better serve the side intake, you know, in, in that case, because the yeah, that's way that the air is being drawn in. 
That's my biggest concern with this design is if you've got a tempered glass case that's, let's say, a little more narrow, that's going to come close to that top fan, you're you're not going to get as good of performance as if you've got a case that's got some side ventilation. Um, I think this would be excellent in some of your small form factor builds that actually are positioned so that they allow for a tall cooler like the uh, the Silverstone that Sebastian did a, a couple of months ago that had ventilation on the sides, but it didn't use a sandwich layout where the motherboard's on one side and the graphics card's on the other. It used a more traditional layout, so you still have room for a tall CPU cooler. Uh, and ventilated on the side, this would be an excellent, excellent cooler for something like that. Okay, we need to move along quickly because we're running later than I thought. In to picks of the week. Josh, get us started. You can never have enough of these. Uh, Sabrent uh, released uh, fairly recently, I believe, uh, a nice toolless USB to NVMe, and it supports both NVMe and SATA drives. So... It's kind of a nice thing. Um, it's a one-stop shop for uh, all of your uh, M.2 form factors. Um, so it's it's good to go. And it's only $27. Brett, what is your pick uh, I, this week? I built uh, my own motorized desk some time ago out of uh, these components. And you could get a motorized desk about this price, maybe about $50 more. But for a dual motor motorized desk that'll lift 250 pounds with a desk that's that they that they say will be up to seven feet long, seven feet by three and a half feet. That's in their specs. You know, go get yourself a piece of lumber or go to IKEA and <clears throat> buy a you know forty dollar piece of, piece piece of, of uh, non lumber. <laughs> yeah, a piece of non lumber. But you know, you could get a really nice looking, maybe not totally sturdy, but you can get a really nice looking piece of big desk that you can attach to the top of this and $214 for a dual motor resizable uh, desk stand is a pretty good deal actually. And it'll, like I said, lift up to 250 pounds uh, up to a, a strangely high height. Well, <laughs> I have one of these. What so. about granite? It hold uh, yeah, granite's granite fine. Flat. Yeah, oh, it's well. fine. It's fine. Okay. What is that? 550 pounds? Sure. Yeah. That seems like yeah. it would be over the limit, but Oh, uh, wait a minute. No, no, it's totally not fine. What okay. did I say? I, right. I was completely wrong. Kent, your pick. My pick. So in the audio community right now, there's a growing movement of people who believe that only the the cleanest measuring amplifiers and DACs should be used. Nothing that gives any flavor or color to the music. And while I understand that, I like clean music as well. You know, it kind of reminds me of the missionaries once saying there's only one way to do that and every other way is wrong. But I think that however feels good, whatever brings <laughs> you pleasure when listening whoa, to whoa, music. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we talking about here? What? what I'm is not sure this? anymore. All right, James. Uh, all right, wait. We're going to have to cut You've this not put a picture uh, up. I've got a link for you. <laughs> I don't want to put this picture on on our website. All right, here we go. A tube so, headphone amp. A preamp. So, oh, oh my. Wait, wait, is it an amp or a preamp or is it both? It is both. This is a an X-Duo MT602 Type A uh, hybrid tube amp headphone amplifier and preamp. Uh, it, it, this is not going to give you the cleanest, most perfect measurements, but... Uh, but it's going to give you a, a warmer tone, especially in, in the low and to mid range. Um, but it still has very good detail and clarity in the, your treble range and upper mid range. Um, it has both a 3.5 millimeter and a quarter inch headphone jack. Uh, there are RCA in and out to where you can feed another amplifier or powered speakers and use the volume control on this as a preamp. And it provides up to 1.3 watts of power at 32 ohms. And again, it's a true class A amplifier. Okay. So it, this is two, three, and transistor 
Pro, right? So the actual power yes. amplifier is a transistor amplifier. Yes. So it's, it's a, okay, but at least it's Class A. So while it, it won't be class especially a. energy efficient, it'll have better, or theoretically would have lower distortion. And So what would you suggest are the proper ohm rating for a set of headphones that would be easy to drive from the SAMP? I would not recommend like using I, I would not use IEMs on this. Um, <clears throat> there is no gain switch and it's pretty much uh, fixed to a high gain mode. So they rate it for 32 to 600 ohms. You can easily drive anything in that range um, uh, up to 600 ohm. Okay. And also these tubes, please tell me they're Russian and in, in Orient, you know, or, origination. You can please. find Russian tubes to fit it. Um, okay. It comes with, I believe, a pair of match GEs, uh, but they're standard six tubes. So there's a lot of uh, tube rolling you can do if yep. that's what you're into. Uh, and that's I what think people get stuff tubes. like this for. You get yourself a solid little box and you just start playing around with different tube combos and Mm-hmm. It would probably be better if you get one that's all tube if you want to do that because there's no getting around the coloration of whatever the solid state power amp is. But Right. <sighs> but okay. again, this is 100 bucks. Right. It's cheap enough Instead to play of, with. Exactly. <clears throat> I will briefly mention, I don't really have a pick this week, but uh, since we talked about the fractal torrent last time... Two day okay, I, I did we did that review uh, the week before and then talked about it on Wednesday. On Friday morning, I had an email from Fractal in my inbox. They've recalled the torrent. They're not selling it. They've halted sales and they are replacing people's fan hub. Apparently, the original fan hub can short circuit, so that's bad. And of course, they're, they're at least they're handling this the right way and right away uh, admitting this and rectifying it. But I guess you can't even buy the torrent, which is one of the best-reviewed cases in recent memory right now because of this. Fractal it's, seems to be doing the right thing here, in other words. Yeah. So that's it's good that they are. It's unfortunate that the product already has an issue. I think that's it for our show tonight. Uh, yeah. We will actually be back next week, believe it or not. I think Jeremy will return, and we'll have some He's semblance boat. of normalcy. Yes, yeah, so I feel like Jeremy takes vacation constantly. I wish I could take a vacation. vacation. I want his life. (sighs) I had to give up something like 80 hours of vacation last year because I didn't use it. That's not right, Josh. That's not right. No, it's not. You should be paid out for that if you don't get to use it. Yeah. (sighs) They want us to take vacation. You know, could I interest you in, in a trip to beautiful southwest Michigan, Josh? Maybe. Okay. We have a lot Looks of uh, great food, uh, lots of bars. We have a famous brewery here. You could see the original Gibson founders? guitar bells? plant. We have founders. Mm. We have bells. It's all here. It's all there. Within 45 minutes of each other. Anyway. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>